Thank you guys so much, Kyle. It's absolutely fabulous to be here. This is my old hood. And it was really cool to come on down here this morning. And of course, as you know, this neighborhood is changing very quickly. And uh, I started out as a planner in this neighborhood. Two colleagues and I decided to start up a planning and design firm we were extremely naive. We had no idea what we were doing. We had no money. Uh, you know that little uh, New York cartoon where a woman in a suit is standing at the on the corner of the street holding a sign that says, we'll work for latte? Uh, that was us. We were, <laughs> we were walking down the street. We were willing to do anything to prove ourselves, uh, to demonstrate that we had something to contribute to city building. And that all started in this hood across the street. We uh, eventually, after a year, we landed a great contract. What you see happening at Union Station right now, we did our very first contract, was doing the master plan for Union Station. We're extremely proud of the work that we did there. And we got a space across the street in a warehouse building with drafty windows. And it was a fabulous open concept, concept space, a wonderful place to work, to be creative. And now I find myself, 15 years later, the strangest thing on earth. I'm in an office, like with walls. <laughs> it's very easily easy to feel extremely isolated. And it's, it's also possible to think about a bureaucracy is not the best place for city building to take place because bureaucracies, of course, are not traditionally thought of as being inherently creative places. But in fact, I think that there's great potential for bureaucracies to become creative places, and there are many creative things that take place in our bureaucracy. In my division, I have a graphics and visualization uh, team that works on, works on developing our plans, but also works on communicating ideas. And I'm looking for Carolyn Humphreys. Carolyn, are you here? Is Carolyn here? Carolyn, stand up. Uh, <laughs> have to embarrass Carolyn because she's the head of our graphics and visualization team and she does amazing work, absolutely amazing work and I'm very grateful um, to have had the opportunity over the past year to have worked so closely with Carolyn because I think we're doing great things together and it's an example of what can happen in a bureaucracy and this really matters because urbanism really matters and I'd love to do a whole talk today on why urbanism matters but I'm not, in part because I suspect that most of you in the room have a pretty good idea as to why urbanism matters. We see it around us every day. We know, for example, that the more urban our environments, that the lower our environmental footprint becomes. We live in smaller spaces. We consume less. We, in fact, have a smaller environmental footprint. We also know that the resilience of our economy is tied to our urban places, the places that we design. So that's, that's kind of a whole other talk that I'm not going to talk about today because I'm actually a bit needy. So I'm here today because I'm needy and I need all of you. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about owning your city and what you can do to take ownership of your city in new ways. Now, as I talk about this idea of taking ownership over the future of your city, I do want to just pause very briefly and talk a little bit about what it is when we're talking about what the consensus is around creating a great city. And this is really important because we don't actually have consensus in this city. We have a lot of debate. There's a lot of conversation going on. So I'm actually going to throw out to you a vision. It's a vision that's contained in our, in, in our official plan. And it's a vision of what a great city is. And this is what I work towards every day, what other city planners, but many city councillors work towards every day. And in part, this is so important because I suspect 
that you're in this room today because you really like your city. In fact, you might even say you love your city. You might speak that strongly. I do. I love my city. It really matters to me. But there's probably also things about your city that really have you worried. There's probably things on a regular basis about the city that you go, you know what? This isn't right. This isn't working. We've got a wicked traffic congestion problem. We've got like the worst traffic congestion in North America. How did we pull that off? That's actually shocking. People actually spend a day a week, the equivalent of a day a week on average, Torontonians commuting, whether that's in a car or on subway, a full day a week commuting. That's how much time we spend commuting to get to and from work. So yeah, that's sort of not working. Some of you might also be familiar with some work done by Dr. David Helchensky at the University of Toronto. He undertook some seminal work in 2005 and came out with a report that's about the three cities that exist in Toronto. And in this report, he talked about how in this city, there is kind of a, there's a, there's a lot of money. There's a super rich category. And then there's, there's a lot of people who are really struggling, poor or working poor, and then there's a middle class. But what was so important about this study, about the three cities, was that what he documented in great detail, not only the geography of these three cities, and there is a specific geography to it, which is very important to us as urban planners, but he also demonstrated that the middle class is shrinking rapidly. And those who struggle to afford to meet their basic needs is rapidly increasing. And we see also a tremendous amount of growth in the super rich category, the very rich category. And this, of course, has a whole series of risks. Some of you may have seen Richard Florida's editorial in the New York Post. It was republished just uh, yesterday, I believe, in the Toronto Star, where he talked about the risk to New York City as they go through their mayoral campaign and the risk being that they don't address this issue of a widening, widening gaps between these three types of cities that exist in urban places. So for all the things that you love, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we love, but for all the things that we love, the challenges that we need to solve are not frivolous. They're very real. And they're essential to creating a great city. So let's talk a little bit about that great city, that that city that we want to own. Let's begin with your home. Let's imagine that in this great city, and this might be the case for most of you in this room, and many people in this city have this, but a growing number don't. Imagine that you have a great place to live that's affordable, well-located, quality housing near where you work. You're not one of those people who spends a day a week commuting because you have a choice to live exactly near where you want to work. You can put down roots, you can know your neighbors, you feel safe, and you thrive. Seems like that's a pretty fundamental need in a great city, that people have that choice to have a great home. But let's imagine your neighborhood as well, that you have a neighborhood where you have, let's say, good schools, community gardens, places to shop, places to worship, the opportunity to do a whole variety of things within walking distance of your home. Those who live in the core of the city, in fact, have that experience. But the majority of the residents in this city do not have that experience. Imagine, imagine in this great city that we're talking about, and there's segments of our city that fit this bill, that you can choose to consume less. You can have less driving and commuting. You can have a smaller stuff with less house, with, 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 with less stuff, a smaller house with less stuff. You can have a reduced ecological footprint so that you can have more. You can choose more time with family and friends, you're not mowing the lawn, more time engaged in your community, more time maybe for cooking or painting or exercising, or more time spent in parks and ravines, or more time kibbutzing in, in coffee shops, being creative. Imagine that in this great city that we're creating together, that this is a place where you can move just in one generation from being a new immigrant to being firmly rooted in the middle class, to be very active in the development of society. That you can come to this city with nothing but desire, commitment, a willing to work hard, and all of the infrastructure that you need exists in this city in order for you to transition to be a part of the middle class. There's transit, there's education, 
There's job creation opportunities. All of this in this great city is at your fingertips. Whoever you are and wherever you came from, you can come into this city and you will be recognized as adding value, as making the city a better place. That's the signature of a great city. But this great city also needs to be a place of innovation. It needs to be a place that attracts growth and is a great place to learn. And as a result, there's many opportunities for creative work. This city capitalizes on the skills of its people, the knowledge of its people. Now, that kind of a city is a place that has resilience in an economic downturn. And there's great literature and data that has looked at what's happened really over the past five years. And those places that have that diversified economy where creativity is valued have also been demonstrated to have a tremendous amount of resilience. Now, if this city is going to be a great city, it needs to have all those things that I've just talked about. But it also needs something else. It needs, it needs beauty. It needs to be a place where design matters. It needs to be a place where the resources that we need to survive, land, water, are handled with care. Where we invest in our public buildings and the public spaces, like squares and streetscapes. These are the spaces where our lives unfold in common. And in this city, those spaces are valued. We invest in them. We recognize them as being fundamental to our creativity. We recognize them as being fundamental to our thriving, and we, we value inspiration in everyday life. So the way we design our spaces in this great city is something that we treat with a tremendous amount of care. So this is something that we're doing in some places in the city, in other places we're not. And I actually think this city of the future is a wonderful promise. I think this city of the future is something that we ought to be working towards, and that's what I, that's why I do what I do every day, I, I really believe this matters. See, but this is the thing. Sometimes I think we can get there. And there's a lot of times when I actually think we can't. <laughs> there's a lot of times when I'm really scared that we can't actually do this, that we don't have what it takes to do this. There have been many times in the past year when I've actually questioned my belief in this vision, I've said, no, we can't do this. I think we know what we need to do. I think we're doing it in some places, but not the majority of places. I think we can look to other cities of the world that are doing bits and pieces, but I don't think we're bringing the whole thing together in creating this great city. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, it's become clearer and clearer to me that the changes that we need to see in this city where we invest, how we design our spaces, how we think about and prioritize affordable housing and designing complete communities where it is possible to have a life that can unfold and participate in a variety of things within walking distance where we know our neighbors, that this is not going to happen unless we all take more ownership of our city. So what I'm saying here is that really this vision will never happen without you. I believe we can achieve this vision of a great city, but only if there's a great qualifier, if all of you take ownership of this vision and take your skills and creativity and recognize them as fundamental to creating the city that we live in. See, people ask me all the time, people come up to me and say, wow, I love what you're doing. I love this vision, it's very exciting. What can I do to help? You know, I go to buy a, buy a book downtown, I walk into a bookstore and, and the owner of the bookstore looks at me and says, are you Jen Keysmet? Yes. What can I do to help? And I stare at him and I think, well, I'm not sure. So I went away and I actually pulled together this presentation because I wanted to be able to answer that question. I thought through that question, what, what can you do to help? And what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the three key things that need to happen in order for this vision to be real. And my hope is that 
in hearing this, I'll answer that question for you. I'll answer that question of what it is that you can do to be a part of owning your city. Now, in thinking through these three things that I'm going to talk to you about today, I went out and I kind of thought about and assessed change, places that have changed, where change has taken place, where we've seen big shifts in ideas. Copenhagen in the 1970s was a traffic congestion mess. Copenhagen today is one of the best cities in the world to cycle. Portland, Oregon in the 1970s was in the midst of building a freeway, not unlike our Gardner Expressway, when something changed. When people took ownership of their city and decided their city was going to have a very different future. We've done that too. We did that with the Spadina Expressway. So what I'd like to do today is walk through really a summary of some of what I learned in thinking about this question in trying to identify where shifts in ideas and ideology have actually resulted in desired outcomes. Because we all know we get a lot of unintended consequences in city planning. We get things that we, we didn't quite mean for it to turn out that way. And we're always asking the question, why would we do that when we know that's such a bad, bad idea? So I wanted to figure out and understand the instances where visions and plans have, in fact, worked. And there's really three critical success factors. And these critical success factors are entwined. If you take one of them away, it's a three-legged stool, it just collapses. You need all three. And the first and the most important, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I actually believe that in this room, you all get this one. You're there. We, this is not where we need to linger. The first one is the need to believe. We're actually rewarded for being optimistic. There was a time when we believed in putting a man on the moon. Now, most people in this room, you've lived your whole life, most of you, probably not all of you, but there's been a, we've known that a man walked on the moon. But imagine before this happened, imagine going, okay, you know, there's some really smart, sciencey guys sitting around the table that go, you know, <laughs> what if we put a man on the moon? Like, wouldn't that be cool to put a man on the moon? Go aside tonight, stand outside tonight and stare at the moon. And then imagine thinking about you're going to get a man from here to there. You need a tremendous amount of belief, a tremendous amount of belief to actually embrace that notion of getting a man on the moon. It took a period of great optimism to do that. And you know, we've had these moments in city building, moments of great optimism. Think of the Bloor Viaduct, for example, which is one of my favorite examples, because, and this is the viaduct that links, that crosses the Don Valley Parkway, it's an arch truss bridge, and this was completed in 1918, and it created, it included a vision for a lower deck. Do most people know this story? It's an awesome city building story. Because in 1918, the Public Works Commissioner insisted on spending an insane amount of money in putting a lower deck for a subway in a city where there was no subway system yet. There wasn't even a subway system and no one lived over there yet. There was no one there. We're struggling today to put subway infrastructure where people already live, where we already need it. But this was visionary. This was belief. Someday be, this will be a great city. Someday in this city we're going to have a subway system. And if we plan smartly, we'll put the infrastructure in place today to not preclude investments in the future. Imagine that kind of thinking today. In 1966, 48 years later, that's when it was built. There was no subway yet in the system. Think about the belief this took. Think about the conjoling, the amount of debate that it took to make this investment go forward. This was a radical, radical idea, and you needed to believe in the future of this city and what this city was going to become. Belief is a prerequisite for acting boldly. You cannot act boldly if you do not believe. Now, the outcomes that we see in our city are a result of believing long before something actually materializes. So we've been having this conversation about investing in public transit. Now, how many people have been following this, even slightly, just slowly your hands in the air? This is a big conversation that we're having in this city. So a couple of months ago, in the heart of our feeling congested campaign, I was having a 
conversation with a friend of mine, a relatively urban person, is quite progressive in his views about the city. And I said, you know, what I don't get is that we really don't need to spend a lot of money, like less than most of us spend on lattes a year, and we can create a state-of-the-art public transit system. I said, like, a few hundred bucks? Like, a mat we could have, like, a blow-your-mind transit system if we all put in a thousand bucks a year, and maybe we prorate it based on how much we make, but it seems so straightforward. And he looked at me and he said, you know what the problem is? I just don't believe it. I just don't believe we'll do it. I would be perfectly willing to put my money on the table. If, you, if I really believed that the money was going to build a state-of-the-art transit system, I would pay. But you know what? I just don't believe it. And if someone doesn't believe, the conversation stops there. You can't go any further. So belief is fundamental to great city building. We need to believe in a future that is different from the future that we have today. But belief enough isn't going to get us there. That belief needs to be combined with the second critical success factor, that belief needs to be shaped by understanding, the need to understand. Because we all know and we've all seen people who believe but don't understand, right? What does that look like? It's like, <laughs> right? Belief must be combined with understanding. And this is where you, as very creative people in this city, have a fundamental role to play in shaping the conversations that take place. There's been a tremendous amount of excitement about open data, for example, and the possibilities of open data. But let's be real, open data, information, is nothing without understanding. We need to figure out ways to take that data and evidence and analysis and turn it into knowledge, to turn it into something that gives us a good understanding of what we need to build and design in our urban places and environments. We hold public engagement sessions as a municipality all the time. We sometimes make a mistake and we in fact think we're consulting when really we're just asking people to tell us stuff because we really don't get anywhere if the information that we get back from the public is uninformed. We have an obligation as a municipality to in fact inform the conversation as a profession, as professional planners, to inform the conversation. And this is a tricky thing. We're going through an exercise right now on feeling congested, whereby we're trying to create a very comprehensive model for data-based network planning, not put a line here, put a line there, but network planning that takes into account not just the TTC, but GO and GO electrification and the impacts that will have, the 10 minute bus plan, land use planning, where is it that we're adding our, our density, taking all these factors together and overlaying them and determining what the implications for various networks, because transit, just like cycling infrastructure, it has to be a network, one line, so what? It all has to work together. And one of the things we're struggling with is how to communicate the complexity of the inputs that go into this conversation in such a way that people can access the information and it becomes meaningful. Because if you don't really understand what we're talking about when we talk about all the inputs and factors and the spending profiles for how we put the, in, you know, the investment comes to the table, if you don't really understand those pieces, it's really difficult to have an informed opinion and to make suggestions about how we could in fact plan our transit infrastructure different, differently. So understanding is fundamental. And this really, uh, this really was reinforced to me in the context of a public consultation process I held several years ago as a consultant in the city of Mississauga. This was on the future of the city. And the outcome of that process was Mississauga in fact embracing a really radical idea which was becoming a transit oriented city. And Mississauga, of course, was built around cars. But that could have only happened because a tremendous amount of understanding was built about the risks of the trajectory that that city was on and the implications around how the dream that had been sold wasn't actually holding up. And in our consultations, I was sitting in a session and we had about 500 people. We'd broken people into small groups. We were about 10 people. I was overseeing the whole the whole event and walking around and there was this one table and there were a lot of people talking and there was a young woman and uh, <clears throat> she was not participating at all. She wasn't saying a thing. She was sitting very quietly, kind of timidly at the table 
And so I went up to her at the break and I said, how's the session going? Are you, are you feeling you can kind of get in there and participate and bring your ideas to the table? And she looked at me and she said, you know, I said, I have really strong opinions on the city. She said, but I've started listening to the people around the table and I've realized that there's a lot of other perspectives and experiences out there and I need to better understand. And so I've decided I'm just going to listen today so that I can better understand so that as the process goes on, I can participate in a more meaningful way. And I went, wow. And she, of course, became an invaluable participant in the process because she was seeking to understand in order to ensure she could participate in a meaningful way. Of course, it's a great risk to our society to have participation that is otherwise. It isn't based in some kind of understanding. So belief, if you don't have belief, you might as well go home. If we don't have understanding, our, enga our engagement, which is the third critical success factor, is again not going to ring true. Belief, informed by understanding, materializes, becomes something that shapes change through engagement. And the third critical success factor is it's great if you believe and you're passionate. It's wonderful if you understand, but now you need to get out and participate and engage in city building. And there's a whole variety of ways to do this. And of course, it's much more than voting every four years. And one of the key ways to begin to do this is to begin to identify your sphere of influence and how you might expand your sphere of influence. Now, there's lots of different things that the people in this room do that I can only imagine. And all of you have some kind of sphere of influence, whether it's with your neighbor or your family or your colleagues or various communities that you are a part of. And I suspect that all of you also understand something and you're seeking to understand something. And one of the challenges in city building that I think we're struggling with today is how to inform the larger narratives around the city and the future of the city and what matters. In presenting at the Economic Club of Canada several months ago, I made a presentation about why we need to refine our transit mojo and talked about how we really have gone through a generation where we've simply given up on transit. Since the 80s, we kind of packed up our bags and did nothing, and now we're suffering the consequences of that. And a participant stood up in the room and said to me, I think that 25 to 35 year olds, the creative types, the people who are driving the growth in the core of the city, who are driving a lot of our economic development, they're the reason that big companies like Coca-Cola are locating in the core, why TD Bank consolidated its GTA operations and moved into the core of the city. He said, I think they get that. They totally get that, that we need to invest in transit. They believe. I think they understand because they live in the core of the city and walk every day in the core of the city. And the question to me was, but they don't engage. They don't vote. You can go look. You can go look at the stats. Not voting. And voting really matters. Because the work that goes on at City Hall and Queen's Park and in Ottawa really matters. It has a profound impact on your sphere of influence. It has a profound impact on the spaces and places where you, in fact, can materialize your creativity. Take this building, for example. Margie Zeidler was extremely visionary in redeveloping this building. It was, at the time, a catalyst for transforming this entire neighborhood which was uh, going through a period where it needed renewal. But Margie couldn't have done any of that without policy from City Hall. Without the policy from City Hall, and uh, I don't know the full story, but Margie may have played a, a, a role in advocating for that policy, but there's lots of great urban seas in the, urban, urbanists in the city like Jane Jacobs and Ken Greenberg and Bob Millward who played a role in bringing the policy framework in place, which was very experimental at the time, taking away all of the restrictions to just see organically what might happen. But if City Hall had said no, if the politicians had said no, we wouldn't be here right now. This building would likely have been torn down. 
So what happens at the political level is essential to what can happen creatively throughout this city. Investment in transit makes that case so transparent because the political decision makers are making extremely important decisions. The decision they made last month was a billion dollar decision about investing in transit in Scarborough. Very important decisions about spending a tremendous amount of money that will have an impact on the spaces and places that we occupy in this city, how we can move, how we can interact, how we can thrive, how that vision that I talked about at the beginning, how that vision can materialize is contingent on a whole variety of decisions that are made in the context of the political process. And I tell this to you because, well, I want to give you a message of owning your city and walking out these doors and choosing to walk to work that the city becomes something of your own envisioning by the choices that you make every day, I also want to leave you with the message that it's imperative to see the political process, to see engaging at committee in shaping the dialogue in this city around the future of this city as a fundamental part of the unfolding of that vision. Now, I'd like to just close this presentation with um, <clears throat> a little message about communication, dialogue, and creativity as it pertains to that last area, which is engagement. Creativity is, at a very basic level, about expression. Creativity is about different ways of seeing. Creativity is about communicating using a whole variety of different tools. It's about taking our energy and our momentum and using it to build some kind of understanding or knowledge. City building has always been a creative exercise. There's a little bit of science in city building. There's a whole lot of art. The extent to which we can draw on creativity in our city building, both in terms of how we design our city and our spaces and our places that we share in common, but also to the extent that we can use our creativity to shape the conversations about the future that we will share as a city will determine our success in materializing that vision of creating a great city. Your city needs you. Please join me so that we can build a great city together. Thank you. Thank you.